Welcome to Wealth is Health. Today we're going to talk through hypertension, better known as high blood pressure. Per the WHO, approximately 45% of adults in the United States and over 1 billion people around the world have hypertension. If these numbers are staggering to you, you're not alone. How can so many people have high blood pressure? Could it all just be a lie? The short answer, while 45% may be a bit of a shock, hypertension really is this prevalent, and this wasn't just a clickbait title. If you want to go now, that's fine. I don't mind, because we're about to go all in on hypertension today. If you're sure you don't have high blood pressure, or you're not a nerd, you may have better things to do, and I understand. Go on. Okay, if you're still here, we're going to dive into how hypertension works, how it's diagnosed, both properly and improperly, why it's dangerous, and then of course, how you can prevent or reduce it. My goal is not only to explain high blood pressure, but to keep it so simple you could explain it to anyone. Let's start with something we've all experienced in the United States. We've all had our blood pressures checked at some point, at the doctor's office or the store while we're waiting for our mom to finish. Hi mom. You remember how it goes. The cuff inflates on our bicep, tightening, 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 until, quite literally, our circulation feels cut off. What follows is that strange sensation of palpable pulsations coming from our arm underneath the cuff. Then, after a few seconds of silence, the cuff deflates. 120 over 80, normal systolic and diastolic, the nurse says matter-of-factly. It was more than the machine at the store ever told me. Which is which? Systolic is the top number. Diastolic is the bottom number. What do they mean, though? Well, imagine your heart is like a powerful water pump, and your blood vessels are like the hoses that carry water to your entire garden. When your heart pumps, it pushes blood through your blood vessels, just like the pump pushes water through the hoses. Systolic blood pressure is like the pressure in the hose when the pump is actively pushing water through it. This is the higher of the two numbers in a blood pressure reading, and represents the force of your blood against the blood vessel walls when your heart beats. Diastolic blood pressure, on the other hand, is the pressure in the hose when the pump is resting between each push. This is the lower of the two numbers in a blood pressure reading, and indicates the force of your blood against the blood vessel walls when your heart is at rest between beats. In simple terms, systolic pressure measures the force during the heartbeat, while diastolic pressure measures force between heartbeats. Okay, if you got all that, and you're still awake, and you can understand the following, you will know as much or more about how blood pressure works than most people in healthcare. Ready? The bottom number is caused, directly and indirectly, by the top number. You can't have pressure in the hose without the pump. I can almost feel your disappointment. <laughs> that's it? Yeah, that's it. But ask somebody in healthcare why the diastolic number is always lower than the systolic. It's really not that well understood that systolic pressure is mostly what drives the diastolic pressure. Not because it's hard, but because after people take tests, they forget 90% of how they learn. Okay, so if 120 over 80 is a normal blood pressure, then let's talk about how hypertension works. We'll start simple. Why is it also known as high blood pressure? Because it's when the blood pressure is higher than it normally should be. As me back in med school would respond. Can you believe that kid? What a smart ass. Anyways, ignore him. Let's go back to the garden hose analogy. Hypertension in blood vessels is like having too much pressure in the garden hose. The force of your blood pushing against the walls of your blood vessels becomes consistently too high, causing them to wear out and even burst. This can make it harder for your heart to pump and may lead to a variety of health problems. So when is it really considered high blood pressure? By strictest definitions, blood pressure is consistently over 130 for the top number and 90 for the bottom number. I won't talk too much about the bottom number. As I said, it's really caused by the top number. Checked multiple times over several weeks, ideally at home as well as in an office setting, qualifies you for the diagnosis of hypertension. If you want to say that your blood pressure of 132 over 85 consistently is normal and fine, and you don't worry until it's more than 140, I'm not going to argue with you. I don't really like arguing. I try to avoid it unless someone might get hurt if I don't argue. If you're 80 years old and your blood pressure is over 130 then less than 140, you're honestly right, it'll probably never hurt you, especially in isolation. But if you're 30 years old, it probably won't hurt you for 20 or 30 years. Even then, it's a maybe. But if we sprinkle in some high cholesterol with a hint of diabetes, then we might have a recipe worth arguing about. So then, if you go to the doctor and your blood pressure is 145 over 82, do you have high blood pressure? Or what if you're in the hospital and you have pain from a fractured hip and it's 1CXC8 over 92? That definitely has to be high blood pressure, right? No. What I really want to focus on is the word I used before, consistently. How do we diagnose hypertension? 
Hypertension is diagnosed by multiple blood pressure readings over multiple weeks, ideally at home and the office. There's a lot of ways to get falsely high blood pressure readings, but if it isn't consistently elevated, it does not necessarily mean you have high blood pressure. An acute stressor can cause high blood pressure, even if it lasts several days. It doesn't necessarily cause any harm or damage. For example, my blood pressure gets elevated when people do things wrong in the hospital and patients get hurt. As long as I stop yelling, take a few calming breaths, it gets better. Do I have hypertension? No, I'm just intolerant to carelessness in patient care. I don't need blood pressure medication. I just need to relax. Take deep breaths, deep breaths. Okay, the reason I harp on this is I see a lot of people get started on new or additional blood pressure medication when in the hospital if they have a few high blood pressures. You know what is stressful? Being admitted to the hospital. You're in pain, maybe vomiting, definitely not sleeping because they wake you up every four hours to check your blood pressure, and then they make a big deal about it when it's high. These folks may have already had hypertension, but they don't need another medication added. They just needed to get over their acute illness and maybe get some sleep. There is more data and literature coming out to support this. I'll link a major study in the description below. Moving on, it's important to know the right and wrong ways to check your blood pressure. The correct way is to sit quietly for a few minutes, then use the properly fitted blood pressure cuff. If it's too tight before it even starts inflating, it will be inaccurately high on your upper arm. Make sure your arm is at heart level, avoid caffeine, exercise, or stress for 30 minutes prior to taking the reading. How could anyone have no stress for 30 minutes prior in a hospital? Jeez. The first step after somebody takes your blood pressure and says it's high with a machine cuff should be to recheck it with a manual cuff. It takes a little more work and time, but manual cuffs are actually more accurate. But a little more work and time? To find the manual cuff, then come back and actually take it? Eh, no, people don't want to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes healthcare is more like healthcare less. So sadly, the first step it most people take is to message or page me to ask about adding medication so we treat the critical red number that now shows up in the computer. It turns from black to red whenever it's greater than 130. And unfortunately, most doctors will respond by just treating the red number. They might not start a med to go home on, but they may add an as-needed medication for the patient while in the hospital. Not a problem, unless, say, your blood pressure is from something like pain, and you get something for pain and blood pressure in a similar time frame, and your blood pressure drops too low. Well, cells without blood flow don't stay cells. It's thankfully a rare event but about 250,000 people die due to hospital errors every year, and this can definitely be one of the contributors. I'm sorry this has really turned into a complaining fest. I've just always imagined, what if it was me or my family member that was the patient? Maybe this approach leads me to take things more personally than I should for my patients, but I don't really care about that. I care about my patients. I do take it personally for them. They don't know any better. They are the patient. The people taking care of them should, though. Alright, back on track. If it's so easy to misdiagnose hypertension, does that mean 45% of adults in America don't really have it? No, they do. Most of the people in the hospital with high blood pressures in the 160s to 180s do have hypertension. It's just usually more control. Just not when they're in the hospital and have acute issues. Okay, we all know high blood pressure is bad. Why? Well, if there's too much pressure in the garden hose for too long, the garden hose wears out early. But it's not as easy to go to the store and buy new blood vessels. When the hose ruptures or stops working, it's not in our backyard. It's in our brain, or our heart, or our kidneys. Sometimes the event is dramatic like with our heart or brain. Water everywhere, people scrambling, lots of crying. Mostly me going in the car home. Other times it's slow and insidious. Like when it's in our kidneys. Why am I peeing less? Was it always kind of red like that? Why is this guy still talking? No one really knows. What we do know is if we bring down the blood pressure to the normal range, risks of these happening do decrease. Eh, except me crying in the car on the way home, maybe. As a short aside, it's helpful to know the difference between primary and secondary hypertension. Primary or essential hypertension, don't ask me why it's called essential, I would have to Google it, is when high blood pressure has no one specific cause, while secondary hypertension occurs due to another health issue or medication causing the high blood pressure. Identifying the type of hypertension is key for choosing the right treatment. Most people have primary hypertension. But if you're really young, especially like a child, and you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, they will work you up for secondary causes. 
There is a lot more caveats to this, but we've let me ramble on for long enough. Finally, let's talk about how you can prevent or reduce primary hypertension. As I have said before, heading right to medication for a fix is not the right way. The major risks to lead the major risks that lead to primary hypertension also lead to diabetes, high cholesterol, etc. So if you want one pill, now or in the future, you might end up with three or more. If you have a heart attack from hypertension and diabetes, especially if you get a stent, you're not going to leave the hospital without these six medications. What medications vary, but I'll say it's usually something like aspirin, plavix, estatin, metoprolol, and trastuzumab, metformin, and probably farcega now. And note I just say started GDMT, goal-directed medical therapy, shorter. Okay, so we don't want multiple medications or heart attacks or any of that nonsense. What can we do? Well, key strategies focus on maintaining a healthy weight. Sometimes even just a 10 to 20% weight loss can cure hypertension or diabetes. And isn't that better than pills? We don't have to be model size skinny. Well, unless you want to be a model, whatever floats your boat. How do we maintain a healthy weight? Well, the fun stuff. Eating a balanced diet, exercising regularly, reducing salt intake, and managing stressors. Now, it can be really hard to be stressed all the time to consistently have a high blood pressure. I've tried. But stress can raise your blood pressure indirectly. What do we do when we're stressed in America? Most of us eat things we shouldn't, drink things we shouldn't, and definitely don't exercise when we should. As a good place to start for weight loss, I'll link my video on three pillars of weight loss here and in the description below. So in conclusion, we now have a better understanding of hypertension, and we can now take steps to prevent or manage it to live our best life, hopefully free of seeing doctors all the time. It's too late for me, but maybe not for you. By following healthy habits, you can reduce your risk and enjoy a healthy life. If you can continue to put up with me, you could like and subscribe to follow along as we continue our journey towards a healthier life. If you just want me to shut up and leave you alone, that's okay too. Screw the algorithm, am I right?